I was here six years ago, not on this stage, but at one church in North Hollywood. And some of you may remember me speaking six years ago, but that day I essentially told the story of how I went from being a homeless high school dropout in Philly to coming to California and deciding to be a screenwriter, writing a couple of screenplays my first year, and I was just about to give up and go back to the East Coast and get a job when God spoke to me through a friend who randomly knocked on my door and she had a message for me. And the message was, write one more script. I mean, I know that it was God because of what happened. But literally the very next day, I was listening to the radio and I heard this song called Seven Days by Mary J. Blige. And it was, she was talking about this friendship, how on Monday we were this, on Tuesday we were this, on Wednesday. You know the song? And then she said on, you know, that day we made love. Now what are we going to do? And I thought, oh, that's the end of act one in a screenplay about best friends who've known each other all their lives. And I literally pulled out my napkin and I wrote the beats of this story. And 30 days later, it was a screenplay. And I called it Seven Days. And I dropped it off at a production company that had a deal with 20th Century Fox on a Thursday. I had less than $500 to my name and three hours later, someone from this company called me and told me that he read my script, loved it. And seven days later, we're here to talk about God. So seven days later, with no agent, no manager, with no agent, no, no, let me, let me rephrase that. With no earthly agent and manager. I got that phone call that 20th Century Fox was buying my screenplay. And a year and a half later, I changed the title to Brown Sugar. And that was my story six years ago. I ended with that sale. And if that was chapter one of my story, I'm here to tell you about everything that's happened since then, chapters two and three. And I'm gonna be very real with everyone here. I lost my mind in 2002. I lost my mind because God blessed me with being hot. I said I'm gonna keep it real. I'm talking about in 2002, I had Like Mike come out, do 66 million at the box office 90 days later. I had brown sugar do close to 30 million. It was made for eight, I was hot. It was like everything that I can think of a studio wanted to buy. In fact, I had a run where I literally sold a new project, a new deal every day for five days in a row. I was hot. <laughs> and I started shopping. <laughs> the cashmere sweater collection was ridiculous. <laughs> I couldn't just have blue. I needed sherbet. <laughs> I, I, I had to get the new whip, and I had the Porsches with the shoes, and I had the new house, and I, I had the new marriage, and every agency in town wanted to represent me. I lost my mind. 
and, and I lost it all. Like that. The new marriage, divorce. Um, that midnight blue Porsche, I love that car. <laughs> but that midnight blue Porsche was replaced by a shiny new white Toyota Prius. I'm talking about the skinny one. Before they were pop, I'm talking about the skinny one with the little skinny tires. I went from the Porsche to the Prius. I did put tent on it, but that's because I didn't want people to see. But I lost it all. I was living in Cala, Cala Blackless. That was Calabasas when it was only D.L. Hughley and his family and me living there. I went from the 5,000 square foot, five bedroom home to in an instant renting a room in the two bedroom apartment in Studio City of a friend. That's what no one knew about the guy that wrote Brown Sugar. I lost it all. I ended up a half a million dollars in debt. And in 2007, I filed bankruptcy. I lost it all. And I can't front, I was mad at God. I, I couldn't understand how he could bless me so immensely and take everything. And if he didn't do it, how could he have let it happen? I couldn't understand it. And it took me a minute to get it because I know God loves me. And I knew that he wanted to, he wanted me to get something that I didn't get. And it occurred to me that he just needed to remind me that although I was hot, he was hotter. He needed to check in with me. He needed me to understand that he is God. He's the genius of the two of us. And, and, and honestly, I, I kind of forgot that. I'm keeping it real. In my hotness, I stopped praying like, you know, in the mornings and at night. And I was one of those just say grace kind of Christians. I started thinking that it was me. And he needed to remind me that is really him, right? And so I got that, and he needed me to know because he had more for me. But, but I needed to understand this, and quite frankly, just so that I can be here in this moment, I needed to be able to, to recognize that it was him, right? So I got that. Here was the second thing. I realized that he was preparing me for something greater. That sometimes we go through the storm just so that he can prepare us for something that we can't even see. How did I go from brown sugar to being in men's grooming at 50? That was not my plan. But, but you gotta understand, so I, I grew up in Philly in a dysfunctional household and I felt invisible. My parents kind of just let me go and I was a ward of the state of Pennsylvania and you know, that was my life. And so when I got 18, I just wanted to be somebody. I wanted to be important. I wanted people to know that I'm important or successful. And so I began defining myself by things and headlines in the Hollywood Reporter, that, that was me. And I was financially reckless. Reckless. What I didn't know was that there was another chapter in my life story that was gonna require financial discipline. It was gonna require a different mindset. God needed to mold me in a way that I could rock that Prius even when I can afford a Range Rover. Because, 
That's what he was preparing me for. He, he needed to strip all that away so that I can be okay with just my direct TV. And I can be okay with having love and friends and being okay with just going to the movies on a Friday night. That wasn't who I was. So he needed to, he needed to strip all that away. And it seemed, quite honestly, friends, it seemed like forever to be in that period where things just weren't working out and everything seemed to go wrong. But it, I'm so glad I just was present and I survived it, right? Because I get it, right? So, so fortunately, I could still write. So I could still make a living. And so I could begin to make it back to some degree, right? I can still come up with a new idea, come up with a new screenplay. I still had relationships in the industry. But now I'm over 40. I'm over 40, and if you're a man who knows that 50 is right around the corner, like 50 is huge for a man. And I'm thinking about where I'm at now at 43-ish and thinking about where I'm going to be at 50 and what I want to be different. And what I realized was that I didn't want to be doing what I had been doing since May 15th, 1998 at 50. I didn't want to be dependent upon a studio choosing my idea, my screenplay, and paying me for it. I, I didn't want to be doing that at 50. No diss, no diss to anybody that does that, but that's not what I wanted to be doing at 50. And so I looked around at some of my highly financially successful friends, and I said highly financially successful friends because success ain't all about finance. So I just want to be clear that I'm just talking about my friends who had a lot of money. And I looked around at some of my highly financially successful friends and the one thing they had in common was they all owned something. They owned a business, and that wasn't me. I, I don't own the posters. I own the flash drive. I do not own my movies. I don't. And so I began to pray, a very specific prayer. I asked God to bless me with an original idea something that no one had thought to do but me. And I was prepared for whatever the deposit was gonna be. If God had blessed me with a new version of bird seed, I would be selling bird seed right now. Because, because I wanted to know that it was from God, whatever I was gonna do. So that was my prayer. People ask me, how did you come up with the, the hammer and nails and all? Listen, it started with prayer, yeah. right? So that was my prayer. So fast forward to 2013. It's March. It's a Sunday. And I needed a pedicure. I wasn't, now, I'm not the pedicure, manicure every two weeks do, like most men. But I needed a pedicure okay. that day. And I went to a nail salon. And it was something about the experience that day that resonated with me in a way it never did before. I began to think about all the reasons why I hated going to a nail salon. I started thinking about the time I opened the door to that nail salon on Beverly and I just popped my head in and all the women in there looked at me with a look that said, what are you doing here? <laughs> this is not your spot, this is ours. I didn't do my hair, you are not welcome here. That was just the energy. <laughs> That was the energy y'all were giving off to me that day, right? But I began to think about all of those moments where I felt discomfort. Yeah. And this particular Sunday, I'm looking around in this very hyper-feminine world. I'm looking at the wall color, the canary yellow. I'm looking at the flowers on the reception desk and all the women around me, and I felt out of place. I felt uncomfortable. And I remember thinking, I wish there was a place for a guy to go 
where he did not have to feel like I was feeling. He didn't have to feel uncomfortable, out of place, or judged. And if there were such a place, it should be called Hammer and Nails. My friends, the name just came to me instantly. I actually tell people that it was deposited to me. So I'm thinking, I wonder if this is the one. And I needed to know for sure because I couldn't afford to do anything that wasn't God's idea. Do you know how rough it out here? Do you know how challenging it is to do anything extraordinary in the world without God? Do you know it's virtually impossible? I needed to know at my age that whatever I was gonna do next, I was aligned with God. I needed it to work out. And so for me, my God wink, and by the way, how do you know? How do you know if this is God's idea or yours? First of all, you gotta be open to the idea that maybe your idea isn't exactly what God wants for you. What if the thing you always thought you wanted to do, what if? God had an even better plan. And I think you'll figure out through the course of my testimony that God's plan is always better than yours. So first you gotta, you gotta be open, right? And if you listen hard enough, if you're still enough, he'll speak to you. See, I have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. That means that I can talk to God like I've known him all my life and I can literally say, God, it's me. Can you give me a sign that this is what I should do? And so I thought, well, what is the likelihood that Hammer and Nails, the most perfect name for this concept has not been trademarked by someone else? There are millions of people on this planet. What is the likelihood that no one had thought to trademark this popular catchphrase before me? And a week later, I found out that no one had thought to do it. No one had done it but me. If that ain't God, like odds mean nothing to God. It was, it was for me. So I decided to do a little research. And you know, as you can imagine, I couldn't do much because no one had thought to do this business model before me. It wasn't like I can sit with the Asian owner of the nail salon on the corner and she or he is gonna sit down and tell me how to run this business. So I had to trust my gut right? And I had to have faith. I needed faith. Now, it helped that I read a, a statistic that was put out by the International Spa Association, and essentially, the stat said that when a man is at a spa, 40% of them get pedicures, and I thought, well, that's an incredibly large number, because I've never walked into a nail salon, and 40% of the clients are guys. But what that said to me was that when a man is at a spa, when he's away from other judgmental men, he's more likely to get this service. So I wanted hammer and nails to be that place where a guy, that God would feel that way, right? Now I needed the money. And I know a lot of people. So I started pitching my business idea to potential investors and everyone said, nah, I'm good. And in fact, one of my friends responded to my text with three letters, L-O-L. -L. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? So fast forward to Mexico, 2013. I'm there for the wedding of two of my dearest friends who are here right now, Maurice and Cotia Lee. And it's funny how God works because the person that was gonna marry them that day never made the trip. 
And so Maurice M. Cotilla asked me to officiate their ceremony. And I was blessed to do that. I had no idea that on the last day of their wedding, I will be sitting in the pool with a woman that is now my wife. <laughs> and Rebecca Elliott. And so she knows me, right? She knows about the bankruptcy. She knows about the comeback. She knows about, she knows all my stuff. So I could be, we can have real candid conversations. So we're in the pool. And Mecca says, so what's up with Hammer and Nails? And I said, well, you know, I tried to get the investors, but no one wants to invest. So she says, uh, she asked, well, what are you going to do? Why don't you use your own money? And the truth is, I never consider using my own money. <laughs> I'm just being honest, like, 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 remember, I lost it all, right? So, so this was right around the time when 20th Century Fox had hired me to attempt a, um, um, a sequel to Waiting to Exhale all these years later. So I just got a check. Come on. <laughs> I mean, just got that check. So. No, I, I had not thought to use my own money because, and I had to be truthful with Mecca because she knows, right? So the truth was I didn't think to use my own money because I was afraid of losing it. Whoa. But did you hear me? I used the word afraid. I was afraid of what could happen if it didn't work out. And it was something about articulating my fear that changed my life. Fear is not of God. Do you, do you hear me? Whenever, whenever it's fear, in that moment, that ain't him. It's not him, because he's always been there for me. What in the world do I have to be afraid of? Because even if I lost that money, I would still be okay, right? So in that moment, I said, when I get on the plane, when I get back home, I'm gonna do hammer and nails. So I got home and I checked my mail. And as you can imagine, I was going for about a week or so, I had a lot of bills. And you know, I'm just going through the envelopes, but there were two envelopes that were not supposed to be in that, in that pile. The first one was green. And if you're in the Writers Guild and you've had movies out or TV shows out, you know that when you get a green envelope in the mail and you get one every three months for life, it's a residual check. Now mind you, I've been getting residual checks since 2003. And to be, if you don't know how they work, they start off pretty big and then they kinda, right? <laughs> Over the years, and it had been years. 11 years of getting residual checks, so I have a pretty good idea of the size of this check. So why was this check like 50 times greater than any other check? Why? The check was abnormal. It didn't make sense. Like Mike came out in 2002, why is this check this amount? And then there was another envelope. True story. It was from 20th Century Fox. And I opened up this letter, and essentially the letter said, Dear Michael, per the fine print in your deal with us, if you're not triggered by this date to do another draft, then we gotta cut you a check and here it is. What? <laughs> what? 
do you understand what was happening while I was in Mexico? Right? Just doing my thing. And, and, and I remember being in the water with my wife and, and, and I said, I am not going to be afraid. What I did not know was that the money was already there to do it. We're talking about God right now. When it's his plan, when it's his plan, the steps are already ordered, right? So now I have the money and I'm going to do this. And I built the shop. And by the time it was time to, you know, open the shop, I had $8,500 left for marketing. And mind you, that's not a lot of money. You know what, let me back up. I left out something really important. Once I had the money, I needed the right location, right? And in my mind, this was always gonna be a franchisable concept. So I needed to be on a street like Rodale Drive or, or Melrose, a street that everyone in the country has heard of. But I had a conversation with God and my conversation was like, God, you know what my credit looks like. <laughs> Remember, I filed bankruptcy. God, you know that I have lease, a, excuse me, I have finance a car credit. I cannot lease a car. I have that kind of credit. How in the world am I going to get approved for a commercial lease on Melrose Avenue with my credit? God said, watch me. <laughs> Okay. So I found this location. It was perfect. It was right across the street from Fred Siegel's on Melrose Avenue. They looked at my credit and they said, um, this is a problem. If you want us to lease you this location, we're going to require a $50,000 security deposit. I said, wow, that's a lot. My agent said, so what are you going to do? I said, how much time do I have? He said, you have about 90 minutes or so because they have someone else interested in this location. So I said, okay, let, let me think about it. Let me pray on it. But I said, let me think about it. And he said, where are you? I said, well, I'm in the valley. I'm on my way to Hancock Park. He said, well, on your way, drive down Melrose. One block west of the spot that you want is another spot there's no for lease sign on the outside. It's going to be available in about a week. Just stand on the outside, and if it's something you want to see, the owner is available to show you the site today. His office is in the building. So I go there, I check it out, and I decide I want to see this spot. So I meet the owner. His name is Kia. I meet him outside, 8257 Melrose. And he walks over to me, and he says, nice to meet you. I have a feeling hammer and nails is supposed to be here. A feeling? <laughs> Let me tell you what that was. A week later, he gave me that spot. Well, well, he never checked my credit. AJ, he never checked my credit. What are the odds that a commercial real estate developer would give me, I'm chocolate, <laughs> I'm just keeping it real. What are the odds of a commercial real estate developer giving me, this black man, the keys for five years without even looking at my financials? What are the odds? Well, we're talking about God. The odds don't apply to him. Do you get that? They don't apply. They don't apply. We're talking about a God that can literally curate. Like he could, he could, what? So, so that's what I left out. So I got that location. Now, fast forward, I got $8,500 left, which isn't a lot to do much with to market this business. However, God is my publicist, which is why on opening day, 
My 1,000 square foot shop with just seven chairs was on Good Morning America. And later that night, it was on ABC World News Now. Really? <laughs> There's 170,000 nail salons in the United States. My shop was on ABC World News Now because... <laughs> I'm talking about God. So I opened my shop. And five weeks later, I'm checking my inbox, and there's a subject line that says, Shark Tank loves hammer and nails. I thought it was a joke. I open up the email. Sure enough, it's the casting manager from my favorite show that essentially said, we heard about hammer and nails. We love it. Would you like to be on season six of Shark Tank? Do you know how many people stand in line to get on Shark Tank? I'm getting an invitation in my inbox? Remember who we're talking about in my inbox. So, of course I said, absolutely, right? And I go on the show. And I remember it was June, it was 2014. I'm on Sony's lot and I'm present. Because I'm standing beyond those double doors that open up before you walk out onto the shark tank. Well, I'm on the other side of that door and I was present. This is what I mean, present. I was present enough to thank God for the moment. <laughs> Didn't matter what the outcome was gonna be. Do you thank him for, the mo for this moment? Do you thank him for the moment? Because I thank God for the moment. And I said a little prayer. I had Natasha, my general manager, with me. And I was like, do you realize where we are right now? Thank you, God, for this moment. And then I heard the director's voice. Three, two, one, open the doors. And suddenly, all I can think about was, my oldest daughter, Essence, who lives in New York, who's seriously critical of everything, I wanted to make sure that I did not misrepresent her. So I was thinking about what I'm looking like and how I'm walking. For Essence, all I'm thinking about is my daughter. But there was a steady cam guy with a camera. And it was crazy that I'm in my favorite show. And so there they are. There's Mark Cuban, there's Lori, there's Robert, there's Mr. Wonderful, there's Damon John. And if you know what happened, I did not get a deal. And I gotta tell you, there's not an entrepreneur that goes on Shark Tank that thinks they're not gonna get a deal. I never ever factored in the possibility that it wasn't gonna happen to me, that, it, that this would be my reality. But when the last person said, I'm out, in that moment, I knew that God was in every situation. Do you understand? Even in the, because what I understood was that it wasn't his plan for Mark Cuban to be my investor. You know why? Because God's plan is airtight. So if it was his plan, it would have worked out. It wasn't his plan. And I was okay with that because I recognize that he's in every situation. He's in every situation. So that's why when I walked away and there's a second camera guy in the back hoping to catch you crying, <laughs> hoping to get that great TV moment where you're just so blue that the sharks didn't invest in you. The reason I was like, oh, I'm good because <laughs> this is going to work out. Watch. That's what I said. I said, watch. Watch God. Watch. So, my episode aired. And thank God I had so many people that were interested in franchise opportunities. I literally had an email database of 800 people who saw me on Shark Tank that wanted information on franchise opportunities. But I still didn't have the money if you know anything about franchising, it's costly. There's a document called the Franchise Disclosure Document, FDD. It could cost you 50 grand or a quarter of a million dollars, and that's just that. So I still needed the money. And I'm trying to get investors even after Shark Tank, right? I still could not get the money. But here's what I knew, that God had a blessing for me. 
The money was there. He just needed, to, he just needed me to use my ingenuity, to use my creativity. God needed me to trust him that the reason that I didn't get the money when I thought I needed it, it wasn't that he had forsaken me. It wasn't that he was too busy blessing you. It was just that he needed to press me against the wall so that I can fight a little different, so I can practice another jab. He needed me on the wall so that I can think differently. Sometimes that's what the storm is all about. You don't give up on God. He's there. That's, but, but the thing is, I was resolute in that knowingness. That's why I didn't give up. That's why I didn't give up and do something else. I was absolutely certain that I just needed to figure it out. So I was in prayer. And then one Friday night, I'm on the phone with Mecca, and I'm talking about all the 800 or so people on my email list. And it occurred to me that perhaps if all these people are interested in a Hammer Nails franchise, maybe there's at least eight that would want to invest in the company. I said, baby, I got to go. <laughs> I got off the phone, pulled out my laptop, and I wrote an email. It took me 20 minutes. And essentially, the email said, um, dear interested franchisee, I don't have an update on our franchise opportunities yet, but stay tuned. But in the interim, there is an opportunity to own shares in the franchising company. It requires a minimum $25,000 investment for 2.5%. If you're interested, reply to this email with the words, interested in investing in the subject line. And then I push send. And three minutes later, three minutes later, remember who we're talking about. You know what I'm about to say. Oh my God, my God, my God. Three minutes later, I got a response, interested in investing. Five minutes later, interested in investing. 15 minutes later, interested in investing. I'm calling Mecca like, I got another one. I got another one. Like, I had over 40, over 40 people responded wanting to invest. Do you know that I raised $200,000 in a week from, from eight angel investors who saw me on Shark Tank who did not know me, who didn't know me? Do you know that one of my investors, her name is Brenda Jones, she said to me, Michael, my husband and I have never invested in anyone, but we felt called to write you a check. We felt called. Do you realize that, think about what happened. God didn't intend for the sharks to invest. He had eight strangers all over the United States. He curated them. Because my investors love God too. What are the odds? But we're not talking about odds. I got the kind of investors who don't send me an email because they want to know when they're getting a dividend. I got the kind of investors that encourage me. Really? I got the kind of investors that encourage me, that pray with me. That's God's plan, right? So I get the money and I'm ready to franchise. I get my first FDD done. I make everyone on my mailing list aware that franchise opportunities are available. I really got to hurry up, but I'll speed up a little bit. And nothing happened. I didn't sell one franchise at first. And then I get a random email from someone who said, FYI, there's a Hammer and Nails in Munich, Germany. It just opened. It's called Hammer and Nagel, which is German for nails. Here's the website. I look at the website. I see my business in Munich in every way framed hammers on the wall, oversized leather chairs. I look at the person behind it and I remember the guy, he was German, he was in LA on vacation, he loved hammer and nails and he, he went back home and opened one up. And I thought, oh my God, I don't wanna be on the sidelines watching someone else run with my idea. 
God, what should I do? And he told me I needed help. So I open a magazine, very random. It's called Franchise Times. And I read a little something about a guy named John Leonicio. If you've ever heard of Massage Envy, well, he founded Massage Envy. He's very successful. Retired twice already. Something says, I want this guy. I want advice from this guy. I want to rock with this guy. Now, how do I reach him? So, I didn't have his phone number. It's not like his email address is on the internet. But there's like six businesses that he's been involved with over his career. And the one thing they all have in common is there's a franchise contact on the contact page. So I wrote an email, an email, that basically said, dear franchise person, I'm not interested in buying a franchise. I just want you to forward this to Mr. Leonicio. And I basically described my business. And then I sent it out on a Friday, about 5.30. And on Monday, I got an email from a guy named Ron Record. Ron Record said, I am the president of the Leonicio Group. We got your email. I just spoke to John about hammer and nails, and John would like you to call him at home. Here's his home phone number. <laughs> True story. So I speak to John, and John says, okay, we talk for, you know, an hour or so. And long story short, he decides he's going to help me, going to consult. But he tells me I need another $200,000. He told me that the reason I didn't franchise successfully the first time is because people are not going to spend $300,000 to open a business when there is no system in place. They want to come to your office. They want to meet your team. They want to know that you're going to be around in 10 years. That's what you don't have. So you need money. Do you got it? No, I didn't have it. But do you got it? I said, not a problem. Do you understand? With 100% swag, I said, not a problem. <laughs> Because he don't know who I know. <laughs> he don't know. He don't, he doesn't know. Try not to use too much slang. I'm been trying to be, he doesn't know. He does not, he does not know, my Lord. So I get off the phone and I call one person. His name is Mickey Fluger. I said, hey, Mickey, you know John Leonicio? He said, of course I know John Leonicio. I said, well, I just got off the phone with him. How do you know John Leonicio? I said, well, this is how I worked it out, and we just talked, and he's going to help me blow this thing up. Um, if you're interested in maybe owning a little more equity than what you currently have, whoa, 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 how much? Come on now. 200K? <laughs> he said, you'll have it tomorrow. So I opened up an office in Woodland Hills, the corporate headquarters for the Hammer Nail Salon Group, 3,200 square feet, hired me a team of smart people, people who knew more about the business of franchising than me, even hired my best friend Lee Lava to come work for me, and we started franchising. My friends, we've sold 232 franchise licenses since last January. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. I, I get to stand here today and knowing that there's a hammer and nails open right now in LA. It, and there's one in Miami that's open right now too. And there's four under construction today as well in other states. We're on our way. But enough about me. Let's talk about you. I got a couple questions. What's that thing that's holding you back? I've been 100% transparent with all of you. What is that thing that's holding you back from doing that thing that you think is bigger than you? What is that thing? Is it fear? Because if it's fear, get rid of it. He's not worthy of that fear. He's been there too many times for every one of us, for you to fear. 
anything. And when I say anything, that includes feeling like you can't do that thing yet because you don't have it all figured out. You don't have all the money. Or the amount of money you need, you can't get from your family or your friends. Fear even includes, it includes everything that's keeping you from jumping. Because that's the only way you soar. If it's fear, get rid of it. Another question. What are you doing for others? Are you the type that prays to God to bless you? But knowing that God uses us to bless others, are are you the type that's just thinking about you? You you don't want to be inconvenienced because you got a bill, but you know your girl needs 50 more bucks. But you got a vacation plan and you don't want to interfere with your vacation. What, What is it? Are you, is that you? Because I say, you gotta change that. The expectation is that he will use you to do his work. It's not a one-way street. What is your level? I I don't know if anyone's quoted Jay-Z on this stage, but. I'm trying to think of the appropriate way to say this. Um, There are levels to faith. What is your level? Because there's faith, and then there's super faith. That's what I got. But it's because it's him. He delivers. He knows your name. He truly knows your name. Like I am living proof that he knows your name. You don't need an agent beyond God. You don't. And my last question. What's your eyewear? Who's your eye whereby? What I mean is, is that there is such a thing called God glasses. What I mean is that when you look at things through your own human eyes, you will see the door that's closed. You'll see the wall that's made of concrete. You'll see the mountain. But when your eye wear is by God, you'll discover that that door that you saw didn't have a lock on it, y'all. That mountain that you couldn't see on the other side of it, when you change your eyewear, you can just step over it. I rock eyeglasses. What are you wearing? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's honor and celebrate once again Michael Elliott. Family in this moment, what What Michael has sown into this place is courage, it's bravery, it's transparency and it's honesty. It's not only asking the tough questions, but being ready and able to receive and face the tough answers that God has for you. So right now, I want to extend an invitation. One of the things that was so consistent about his testimony is every step that he took 
was a God step. There was never, he would question whether it was God or not, and if it was God, he was going to do it. It didn't matter how crazy it sounded. It didn't matter whether it made sense to him or not. If he knew it was God, once God said yes, he did it. So in this house of courage and in this house of bravery, I want some courage filled and brave folks to come forward. If you have not begun the life where the only steps you take are the ones that God says yes to, if you have been walking according to your yes and not according to his yes, let's break that habit. Come on down to this altar right now. Right now. Right now. Doesn't matter who's looking. Don't worry about that. Right now, we all, we all have on God glasses. All we see is you doing what you need to do. Come on down right now. While, while those people are coming, if you haven't even had a relationship with God, if you have not had the open and honest one-on-one -on -one communication with God, like Michael was speaking of, if you've not even thought to do it, or ooh, if you thought to do it and you decided not to because you were afraid of what he might say, come on down because the truth is those conversations with him are the best things in your life. They're just waiting to happen. Come on down, come on down. Start a life right now where you and God talk it out. And whatever he speaks to you, you walk it out. Come on down. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Father, we thank you for clarifying the order of things. We have our thoughts, we have our desires, we have our dreams, but Father, then there's yours. There's your thoughts and your desire and your original intent for every single person who received this message today. And in this moment right now, with our hearts, with our minds and with our spirit, we invest in your yes. We invest all of who we are and all of what we have in your yes because we know that you will grow and multiply and expand all of who we are and all of what we have when we put it in your hands. Father, we receive your open hands in every area of our lives. And Father, we open the door to areas of our hearts we were afraid to show you. Any area of our lives where there is a kernel of fear, we uproot that thing, we bind it and we cancel it and we cast it out in the name of Jesus. Where there was once fear, we now boldly proclaim courage. We boldly proclaim strength and we boldly proclaim your vision and obedience to your word. Father, we thank you for truly ordering our steps. Literally, you brought us to this place. You allowed our ears to hear this word. You allowed our hearts to be pricked by this word. And so with everything that you've allowed to take place, Father, let this be the beginning. Let this be, be the beginning of a walk by your ordered steps. Let this be the beginning where your path is the clearest. Father, where your path is the only path that we will take from this moment forward. And Father, let this be the beginning of seeing life with your lens. 
let this be the beginning where supernatural vision becomes our norm. Where we see what others cannot see, where we go where others cannot go, where we boldly proclaim and speak what others will not boldly proclaim and speak. With what we have received today, we are equipped to do and be the exceeding abundant far and above what we could ask for or imagine that you, only you are capable of bringing to life. So Father, we seal this. We seal this word, we seal this moment as sacred. No one, no thing can touch or take away the seed that was planted in this place, in your hearts, in your minds today. It is sealed. So Father, as we move forth, as we begin this week with new seed, as we begin this week with new vision, as we begin this week with new order, Father, Make your word and your presence clearer to all of us than it has ever been before. And let us only go where we know your hand is. Going forth boldly and bravely and filled with the courage that could only come with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.